So in this second talk, and there'll be lots of room for asking the questions I know you long to, to ask, and they may be uh, more about practicalities, I understand that, and I'm sure all our lives are very much dependent on practicalities. But I do believe that as Whitehead said, as we think, so we live. So it's very important to change the way in which too much of the time we're encouraged to think. And it's that that I'm really here to address. I'm afraid the fair may be rather different from what you're used to, but sometimes it's quite amusing to hear a different point of view. And I, I don't know whether I'm a Christian or not, really, which, which, which may scandalize people, but all my life I've found it enormously compelling. And indeed, my original idea was to leave school, study theology, and go into a monastery. Fortunately for the monastery that I had in mind, I, <laughs> I didn't do this. Um, and also, fortunately for me, I discovered that I was a much too worldly a being. Um, but I want to, to talk a bit, a bit about the sacred and a bit about the soul. What is it we mean by the soul? I'm going to suggest that this outmoded concept is not outmoded at all. It's incredibly important. It's another thing we need to get back into the center of the field of vision. Really what I'm saying is that we're all stuffed unless we get back to a sense of the, the really important things that drive uh, and guide our lives towards something greater than ourselves. I think what we need is a sense, recovering a sense of awe and wonder before the world. It's been driven out by the sense that we're so clever we know it all. But as you remember me saying, that's a sign of stupidity. Um, and we need to get back some degree of uh, modesty. Scientists often have useful things to say, but I want to say to them, I'd love it if you were able to see other people's points of view and how little in the end science can really answer the questions we want answering. And I think compassion is the other thing. Or modesty and compassion is not much present in the discussions whenever I look at them online. So I'm going to make some preliminary reflections on the sacred and then I'm going to talk about the soul. And I should warn you, um, you have to give trigger warnings nowadays, that I'm, um, I'm a process theologian if I'm a theologian at all. So those of you who hold no truck with process theologians, you can leave now. But <laughs> um, Rowan Williams is an enormous fan, as I discovered, of my work. It took him about a nanosecond to realize that the master in his emissary is crypto-theology. And I kept my theology pretty crypto until the very end of the matter with things. But the only thing we really disagree on, and we've talked in private and in public a number of times, and some of these are on YouTube. Um, probably the only thing we really disagree about is that he's not very keen on process theology. But I think what he thinks I mean by that is that God is only in process and that things are only in process. But God is paradoxical if ever there was a paradox. And God transcends language and concepts if ever anything transcended language and concepts. And one thing I'd like to say is that I'm quite aware that God can be transcendent and above time. But also, this is part of the whole Christian story, is also imminent in his creation. And in that respect, he partakes of it and is a God that is in becoming. So what is the sacred? Well, according to Lao Tzu, he who knows does not tell and he who tells does not know. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll go on then. The, pa the power of unknowing and not doing I've referred to is very important in Chinese philosophy, but it's also in the Western tradition. So in Meister Eckhart, who I think is an endless source of wisdom and deep thinking, in one passage in a sermon, sorry, is it making a kind of echoing noise? It's difficult to get, if you're too close, you get that, but if you're too far away, you can't hear me, so forgive me, I'm doing my best. Um, in one passage in one of Eckhart's sermons, he speaks of the attainment by the soul of darkness and unknowing. 
And he imagines a bystander asking him, but what is this darkness and unknowing, and what is its name? You know, good left hemisphere question. To this he replies, I can only call it a loving and open receptiveness, which, however, in no way lacks being. It is a receptive potential by means of which all is accomplished. This suggests the fertility of union between a creative principle and a receptive womb-like space in which something is to grow, a process. And it's of this encounter, this process, that I wish to speak to you now. Whatever the sacred is, it cannot any more than God be caught in the nets of language. It has to be experienced to be understood. It's not irrational any more than music. For me, perhaps the most natural home of the sacred is irrational. Rather, it's beyond mere rationalizing and therefore supra-rational. It cannot be seen or measured and thus validated by experiment, but this no more implies that it's unreal than does the unseen, immeasurable nature of love. The physicist Niels Bohr said, the fact that spiritual traditions through the ages have spoken in images, parables and paradoxes means simply that there are no other ways of grasping the reality to which they refer. But that doesn't mean that it's not a genuine reality. Like beauty, goodness and truth, it would seem like atoms and their quantum fields that it rebuffs precision and yet we do know don't we perfectly well when we encounter it if we're not incapable of sensing it it's not i mean the sacred decomposable into any parts whatever it's dependent on a whole context be that as apparently simple as a place of worship or an ancient grove or a single human act of self-sacrifice, or as wide as the whole cosmos. It is instinct with life. It is indeed a living presence, not a mere representation. Now, in the matter with things, I argue that what we call things are experiences, processes that go on between ourselves and there's something other than ourselves that we end by calling a thing. In other words, a new integrated reality stems from our encounter, one in which both parties to that encounter are now subsumed, and I talked about this earlier. This is important for our consideration of the sacred because it doesn't reside in some thing alone or within us alone, but in an encounter which brings what we think of as two, the sacred object and our transformation by it, into unity. In such a relationship, both or all parties are changed. Incidentally, perhaps this is why visiting holy places such as the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi or the Pilgrimage Church of Conque in central France seem to exhibit such an extraordinary resonance. The reciprocal truth of the observer changing what is observed is that what is observed changes the observer. This was a view espoused by Goethe, and not just in the obvious way you might imagine. According to him, we literally grow faculties in response to what we experience. He held that an object properly contemplated generates in the beholder the faculty proper to its experience or its perception. He says every new object well contemplated and clearly seen opens up a new organ within us. And in the case of the sacred, that organ is what we have traditionally called the soul. Now, in many parts of the world, people report having experiences that are not common amongst ourselves. Children often report, up to about the age of five or six, after which they're so discouraged by adults telling them that they're lying. They experience things that we don't normally experience. And there are peoples around the world who say that they hear and see things, sometimes at a distance, in time and space. And who are we to say that they don't? we may have lost those faculties by simply not exercising them and by their being discouraged in us from birth. I would suggest then that the sacred exists not simply in this or that thing, an object, a place or an act, but in the relationship between whatever it is beyond ourselves that we recognize as sacred and that part of our being that has been traditionally referred to as the soul. Indeed, I believe that the possibility 
of this relationship is one of the reasons for evolved beings such as ourselves who have come into existence. I started by saying we don't seem to have the foggiest idea what a human being is and what it's doing here. But let me suggest that it's not as obvious as it might seem from a point of view of science. Science thinks that uh, complexity in organisms simply advances and it's about competition for survival. So really what we're doing here is just trying to survive more. But of course, the same question, what is the use of use, turns up. What is the, the point of surviving if you don't know what you're surviving for? But get this, over the course of evolution, we've got less and less good at survival. So there are actinobacteria in the depths of the ocean that are half a million years old, single-cell organisms that are themselves 500,000 years old. Um, and elephants live longer than we do, trees live a great deal longer than we do, just we have this 70 years. Um, and as Whitehead, A.N. Whitehead, the philosopher, who was a process philosopher, said, the secret of survival is not to be alive. Rocks survive for millions of years. Once you start having living beings, the cost of their living is that they find it very hard to survive for a long time, at least when they become complex. So why have we become complex? My answer to that is that the cosmos is conscious, that the whole of the cosmos is a conscious being, and that what we call matter is a phase of consciousness. Now you may say, well, it doesn't look like consciousness. This desk doesn't look like consciousness. This bottle doesn't look like consciousness. It doesn't, I agree. But we only know what we call matter because we have consciousness. We don't know that we experience consciousness because we have matter. That may be the case or may not be the case. But it's certain that we only know matter through consciousness. Certain aspects of our consciousness we call material. And I think they're, they're a phase of consciousness. So matter is what happens to consciousness when it wants to offer some resistance and some permanence, a degree of permanence. Anything I say now is gone in a second, but this desk, for better or worse, will be here tomorrow, we hope. So, and resistance is again not negative. Resistance is creative. It's out of resistance that things come forth. So what I'm really getting at is what are we doing here? We're here because we can respond to that consciousness. And that consciousness has within it already the elements of goodness, beauty and truth. This was Plato's truth and it's my truth now and it's a Christian truth as well. So <clears throat> those demand relation, they demand response, much as love cannot be love without a response. And we came into being to respond, I believe, to a cosmos that is founded on love, to reciprocate that love, to be worthy objects of that love and to return that love. But also goodness, beauty and truth are, are not just sitting there in a cupboard. They are f fulfilled through a relationship between beings that create and that experience and that know one another and fully see one another. So. I would say the purpose of our lives is to respond to those things and we're free to respond to them or not. The more we respond to them, the more we alter the universe. The more we are responsive to the good, the true and the beautiful and to the holy, the more we strengthen them, the more we bring them about in the world. If we choose to ignore them, then that is our problem, but we have not contributed what we were born to contribute. So what I think about the soul is that it's like any organism, it's in process. We're all in process all the time. Even a single cell that you see in a diagram in a biology textbook or you see a photograph taken down a microscope, it looks solid. It's got a, got a membrane around it and it looks like it's, it's just there, it's a blob, a thing. But actually, if you were able to see it in real time, you'd see that that membrane was constantly dissolving and reforming and there were holes and portals in it through which things came and went. So it was a kind of process that was going on in a very localized way. Well, we're all like this. And the soul is too. It's in touch with the creative principle in the cosmos, which is part of what we mean by the divine. And that divine principle too, I claim, is in process. Why do I say that? Well, 
Again, according to Lao Tzu, the, the author of the Tao Te Ching, which is the, the, um, the, 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 the chief document of Taoism, and Taoism is entirely compatible with Christianity. In fact, one of my favorite books is called The Tao of Christ. According to Lao Tzu, the Tao is said to be in the world like a river flowing home to the sea. Wordsworth saw this too when he spoke of the divine in nature as something that rolls through all things, as in a wonderful phrase, something evermore about to be. In the Tintin Abbey Ode, he wrote of a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. This seems to me not far from the core perceptions of a number of religious traditions. And not just in Wordsworth, but in Jacob Burma, a Christian mystic, there is an expression of a constant longing and its fulfillment in a something that is evermore coming into being. In another wonderful phrase of Wordsworth, that's the something evermore about to be. Now both Meister Eckhart and another medieval mystic, Mechthild of Magdeburg, speak of God as flow. Mechthild spoke about the flowing light, the flowing fire of God's love, which never stands still and always flows effortlessly and without ceasing in so sweet a flood. For Meister Eckhart, being which emanates from the loving God must flow, because, like love, it constitutes a continual movement toward the other. It's not a thing. It's not static. It's a relationship that is always in process, always growing, always transforming itself. Moreover, being is a continual becoming. According to Eckhart, God, in his incarnate form as Christ, streams forth from the Father's heart endlessly into the God-loving soul. Quote, he is being born anew unceasingly, and this same birth today in the God-loving soul delights God more than his creation of the heavens and earth. Eckhart is said to have said, we are all meant to be mothers of God, for God is always needing to be born. According to him, then, God also depends on us to some extent for his further coming into being. Indeed, elsewhere, Eckhart, who loved to shock us out of our complacency, put it like this, God loves the soul so deeply that were anyone to take away from God the divine love of the soul, that person would kill God. Coming forward to the last century, we find Whitehead writing that the world and God bring each other into existence and that therefore we play a part, an important part in whatever it is. Our being here is not just trivial. A lot hangs on it. We have a role to play for the one time that we're here to bring more into being this world of the divine vision. But there are, to my mind, pointers even within the core texts of Judaism and Christianity, the Old and New Testaments. For example, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, in our translation into English, God said, I am that I am. But actually the Hebrew, means I will be what I will be. In other words, it's already looking forward to a process and when God created the world, after each act of creation, it says in the Bible that he looked and saw that it was good. And I think the original word means beautiful as well as good. And that is an extraordinary thing, because it wasn't as though God had just kind of got creation in a cupboard and dusted it down and wheeled it out and go, okay, day one, day two, I know it all anyway. It, it, he was actually experiencing something that was coming into being, that was responsive to him and came out of him. And the word meaning Christ was made flesh, not as in the Latin verbum caro factum est, but as in the Greek, hologos sarxigeneto, which means begotten, not made. That's a very important phrase in the creed. Why have I emphasized the processual nature of the divine, the sacred, and the soul? Because it immediately places our capacity for responsiveness to the sacred nature of what we behold, the growing of our soul, at the center of the story of our life. 
I also acknowledge that in the single case of God who embraces all, it's possible to hold that God is both a becoming in that he is imminent and timeless being in that he's transcendent. Keats, the great poet John Keats, called this world a veil of soul making. The soul is a faculty like intellect or eyesight, but much more than and more important than either, and our sense of the sacred is both driven by and in turn drives the actively receptive attention paid by the soul. The soul is capable of nourishment and enrichment or of being stunted and withering away. James Hillman, a follower of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, wrote, The soul is less an object of knowledge than it is a way of knowing the object, a way of knowing knowledge itself. I suggest, therefore, that we need first to attend to our souls if we're going to recover the sacred in our lives. So what then is the soul? In a left hemisphere dominated culture like ours, the soul simply ceases to make sense. Do we have a soul? A journalist asked the philosopher Dan Dennett. We do, he replied. It's made of lots of tiny robots. Such is the product of this great man's knowledge. So let's not be too downhearted by our unknowing. I put good money on our unknowing rather than Dennett's certainties. What can we say of this soul? At the beginning, let us take heed of a warning from that ever-wise Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher, who in my view is the wisest philosopher to come out of the Greek world. You will not find out the limits of the soul. Whatever way you travel, so deep is its logos. And logos here means its being. However, metaphor is a way to deal with what declines to be revealed in everyday language. What metaphors might just help us carry across the abyss of our unknowing. Well, we've heard of the Tao as a river, so let's think about water for a minute. According to the great philologist Max Müller, soul comes, the word soul derives from a Gothic word, saivala, and this is clearly related to another Gothic word, saives, which means the sea. The sea was called saives from a root, si or siv, the Greek seo, to shake. It meant the tossed about water in contradistinction to the stagnant or running water. The soul being called Saivala, we see it was originally conceived as a sea within, heaving up and down with every breath and reflecting heaven and earth on the mirror of the deep. Incidentally, there is a film called Insai, I-N-N-S-A-E-I, which, is, which I was interviewed for, made by an Icelandic um, filmmaker, I uh, can't remember the name now, <laughs> this is a very long name ending in daughter. Um, uh, anyway, she made this film called Insai, and she has a lot of imagery of the sea, because in Icelandic it both means the sea within, and it means insight. So our insight is to see this sea within. And this reminds me of Rabindranath Tagore's great insight that there are two kinds of understanding. The small wisdom is like water in a glass, clear, transparent, pure. The great wisdom is like the water in the sea, dark, mysterious, impenetrable. So much for water. Well, I have a drop anyway. What about air? In every culture... Breath and movement are seen as part of the soul. Soul as breath in Greek, pneuma and suche. In the Hebrew, ruach and nefesh. In Latin, anima. Breath dwells in the breast and is feminine in nature. This is the soul. So we've heard about water and we've heard about breath and air, therefore. What about fire? Eckhart spoke of what he called the funkline, which means the little spark which comes from, corresponds to, and reaches out again to the divine as a potentiality, a latent function that needs to be nourished to grow and expand. And the 17th century metaphysical poet Henry Vaughan called his collection of poems Silex Sinterlands, which means sparks from the flint. 
In other words, the image is that of the flint, however hard, under the blows of life, brings forth a spark, suggesting that it involves and is nourished by a form of suffering. And in Plato's seventh letter, he describes philosophy, which after all was his life's work. And he says it doesn't admit of exposition like other branches of knowledge. But after much converse about the matter itself and a life lived together, suddenly a light, as it were, is kindled in one soul by a flame that leaps to it from another and thereafter sustains itself. This is very much my experience of education into everything, into a religious life or disposition and into all the things that I was taught was that it was not about the insertion of facts, but it was about a spark a relationship between a teacher and me and what was, was the fire that animated that teacher caused a spark to arise in me that was living and quite different from any dead data that were fed into me that is what an education is being a teacher is a relationship it's not about stuffing things into people being a doctor is about a relationship it's not about mending bits of a machine We've lost sight of these very important roles. Eyes, too, are thought of as windows of the soul. The sense of something coming out of the eye in the ancient world uh, lasted right through to the Renaissance. Homer describes the beams penetrating like the sun which come out of the eye of the eagle, and so on. So there was this idea of the primeval fire hid inside the pupil of the eye, and Plato in the Timaeus um, writes that a smooth, dense stream of gentle light from the purest fire within us merges with the light from what it sees, so that one body is formed between ourselves and the object of our vision, conveying the motions of what is seen into every part of our body and soul. So it's this idea, once again, that there is an encounter here which is neither wholly objective nor wholly subjective, but importantly transjective. It's a relational thing in which the ourselves and the world are co-creating one another, constantly changing one another and bringing things into being. But unfortunately from Plato came the divorce between soul and body and that was carried over into Christianity for a couple of thousand years. The problem here is the fruitless switching between two parts of a false dichotomy, body and soul. I refer to a concept I call semi-transparency. Something is seen all right, but seen through. It's rather like looking on a pane of glass, as Herbert says. You can let, rest your eye on the pane of glass, or you can look through, and then, as he says, then the heavens espy. So everything we look at, we can pause our eye on what it is, or we can see through it to what lies behind it and beyond it as is implicit in it. So in this sense, we don't find the infinite by turning away from the finite, but by looking into it more deeply. A looking into in which the finite is not just a means to the end of infinitude hence I say semi-transparency because the finite is precious in its own right and worthy of the eye's delay as it passes through again we see the general not by turning away from the particular but by looking intently at the particular at the individual so as to see into it there are lots of people who love mankind you know and I find they very often don't love any people at all Whereas there are people who, who may um, be very loving to people but don't really love mankind as a whole. These are entirely compatible positions. And I, I think um, the, the important thing here is to realize that we can see one through the other. The soul is both in and yet transcends the body as a poem is in and yet transcends the language in which it's written a melody is in yet transcends mere sound a painting is in yet transcends the merely frescoed wall another way to get closer to what we mean by the soul is to contrast it with any viable alternative can it be substituted say mind or heart Feelings, conscience, imagination? I don't think so. Unlike any of these, the soul places the person in the widest context, a context outside the confines of immediate time and space. 
It invokes a gravitas that none of the others evoke, and it involves destiny. In all these respects, it's more than any alternative. In Shakespeare's Othello, at the opening of the last act, Othello is wondering how it is that he can bring himself to, to kill his loved one, Des, Desdemona, but he feels that honor requires him to do so because he misunderstands that she, he thinks that she has been unfaithful to him. And he says, in contemplating what to do, he says these rather wonderful and enigmatic words, it is the cause, it is the cause, my soul, let me not name it to you, ye chaste stars, it is the cause. Well, he says, it is the cause, my soul. It wouldn't have been the same if he said, it is the cause, my imagination, or my mind, or something of this kind. And then Wordsworth, in the Tintern Abbey Ode again, until, he says, the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, not a living heart not a living imagination, not a living conscience. There is no other word but soul for what is meant here. And then there are Henley's Victorian poets defiant words beloved of Nelson Mandela. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And the very words cause the hair on your neck to stand up in a way the other words simply don't because it has another meaning. It may also, of course, involve feelings and emotions, but it clearly goes beyond. Why, in the Psalms, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou so disquieted within me? Or think of a soldier, a refugee, a bereaved soul, we think of these people. We don't think of them as a, just a bereaved person. There's something about the soul that is crucial here. And it's something that is very much expressed by Renaissance church music. It was one of the great loves of my life. And when I first heard it, I realized that describing it as intellectual is not enough. Describing it as emotional is somehow wrong. The only thing you can say is that it appeals to the soul. Now, could we have the next clip, please? Just, could we stop there probably, yes. It's the, the first part of John Taverner, the 15th and early 16th century composer's Western Wind Mass. That was the first Kyrie. And we could have indulged the Christe and the Kyrie again, but unfortunately I probably can't best carry on. But the point I wanted to make is that this cannot be described using any other language than the spiritual. It's, it's not emotional in any sense. It's far, far more than that, far greater than that. And I think can alone speak to us, if we'd lost our faith, of there being something very important that we're missing. So I don't think it can be reduced to feelings and emotions, but it's not also reducible to the intellect. Uh, Evangelos Christu, in his book Logos of the Soul, writes, A person who spent his life in a cell may have enriched and deepened his soul, 
And this wouldn't mean, moreover, that he spent his time accumulating fantasies or writing learned treatises. And the uh, 19th century American pragmatist philosopher and mathematician C.S. Peirce wrote in an essay rather delightfully entitled Detached Ideas on Vitally Important Topics. He writes, it is the instincts, the sentiments that make the substance of the soul. Cognition is only its surface, its locus of contact with what is external to it. And I'd say it's not also just our moral sense. So Iris Murdoch, in her play Above the Gods, writes, In a way, goodness and truth seem to come out of the depths of the soul. And when we really know something, we feel we've already known it. Yet also, it's terribly distant, farther than any star. We're sort of stretched out. It's like beyond the world, not in the clouds or in heaven, but a light that shows the world, this world, as it really is. That is beautiful for many reasons, but one of them is that it, it shows that somehow whatever this thing is that is the soul, it's already in communion with the entire cosmos. So when we are treating our souls, mending our souls, healing our souls, when we are dealing with our souls, we are dealing with the cosmos at large. I want to say this because people often feel hopeless in the modern condition. They see all kinds of disasters arising around us. The fragmentation of society, the decline of a civilization, the destruction of forests, the poisoning of the seas, the, you know, the, the destruction we have wrought on ourselves and all that we've created. And they think, well, what can we do? And my, my answer is, well, you don't need to feel impotent. Because each one of you contains in yourself a place you can start right now. You don't have to even to wait till tomorrow. You can start seeing the world with new eyes. You can start attending to the world differently. And you can practice this and it will grow very fast. And then you start to see all kinds of things that you didn't see before. Now you may say, but that's only for me. But I think I've pointed out that how we attend to the world actually changes the world, what is there. It doesn't just change us, it changes something outside ourselves as well. And that is important, because unless we get the spiritual bit right, the core of everything, the stuff that we need to do around the edges will never stand up. We'll just carry on being the same disgruntled, entitled, selfish, sad specimens of humanity. We need to recover that spiritual heart. And in what Murdoch says, there's a couple of evocative ideas. The connected but stretched out nature of our relationship with the sacred, which is really another way of saying it's here, but it's also out there as well. And she uses the word longing, you see, and, and the word belonging, actually, the, the business of feeling where it is, that you are known, recognized, and feel to be your home. They come from the same root in Anglo-Saxon, langian, which means to stretch out. So longing is when you feel this stretching feeling towards something to which you're still connected, but would love to be closer. And that feeling of longing is also central to the religious life, the feeling of something that is one's home, where one belongs, for which one longs, and one feels oneself not isolated from it, not cut off, but this sense of being stretched out. Well, we've dealt with feelings and emotions. It's not that, it's not intellect, it's not the moral sense. How about imagination? Again, it may involve imagination, but clearly it goes beyond. So I want to just recommend to those of you who have never seen two films that you should see them. You should make it a priority to see them. And they are the work of Andrei Tarkovsky, who is without doubt the greatest filmmaker that ever lived. He's the only filmmaker of whom you could use the word Shakespearean. There's almost no artist other than Shakespeare to whom you can apply that term, but I am willing to apply it to Tarkovsky. And he made two utterly shatteringly profound films. One is his film Andrei Rublyov. And Andrei Rublyov was an icon painter in 14th century Russia. 
And I won't tell you what happens in the film because in a way that's not really the point. You need to experience it. It's a very powerful meditation on, on life, on violence, on love, on the holy. And you come out of it an utterly changed person. I could hardly speak for several days after seeing it. It had such a profound effect on me when I was about 17. And the other film that he made is a film called Solaris, which he made in 1972 before he emigrated from Russia. Um, and he, he made various films, but his two best, interestingly, were made <laughs> with the necessary resistance that came from fighting the regime. He was, as it were, a, a Samizdat filmmaker. And when he came to the West, he was showered with money and with goods and with people who wanted to help. But he never thereafter really made such great films. But these two, Andrei Rublyov and Solaris. There is another film, unfortunately, an American film made in around 2000 called Solaris. Don't touch it with a barge pole. Make sure you're dealing with the, the Russian Solaris. And it has such profound things to say about the soul, particularly Solaris. Uh, again, I can't unfortunately tell you about it, but just watch it and remember that what you're looking at is the growth or otherwise of a soul. So we've looked at things it's not. More positively, what can we say? Well, it's that which responds to the unknown other with love and gratitude. It's that which is stirred in us by nature and which experiences it with awe and wonder. It's that which brings into being a relationship with the sacred other, an otherness that is both transcendent and imminent. In other words, in Iris Murdoch's words, we, we're sort of stretched out. And yet, though the divine other may be indefinable and ungraspable, by definition, something beyond, it is not remote. It is more core to us than anything we can know. We are steeped in soul, as Taya de Chardin said, by means of all created things, without exception, the divine assails us, penetrates us, and moulds us. We imagine it as distant and inaccessible, whereas in fact, we live steeped in its burning lairs. Astonishing lines. Can we reintegrate the soul into a new cosmology? I believe so. And I think it's essential to everything we hold dear, right down to our very survival as a species. Well, how? <laughs> At the beginning of part three of The Matter With Things, I refer to a legend of the Onondaga people who are part of the Iroquois nation in America. Um, which is uncanny because it predicts what is known about the structure of the brain, which I've been not today talking about, but talking about in other contexts for decades. I only came across it recently. They had no MRI machines, but they knew what was going on. And you find this embodied in mythologies all around the world, that there are two creative principles, one of which is more benign and more intelligent than the other. And both are required, but one of them needs to be the guardian of the other. And so in this legend, there are two brothers. Uh, for the sake of the whole universe, two brothers are sent from the gods to create the world. And the elder brother, is his name is, he holds the sky with both hands, interestingly. And in the legend, he represents the power to remember one's higher identity in the midst of action in the world. He has, however, a twin brother called Flint, who declares... I'm not thinking about the place from where I came. It's sufficient that my mind is satisfied in having arrived at this place. This place will become exceedingly delightful and amusing to my mind. I trust in the thing which my father gave me, a flint arrow by which I have speech. Extraordinary. The two functions of the left hemisphere, to be able to capture prey and to speak. This I will use perhaps to defend myself so I will not think of that other place. So however much we were... Once like the mindful brother in this story, we've become like the mindless one. And according to the legend, this is a calamity. And what it requires is that, well, I'll, I'll say a little about it. I can't unfold the entire story, but it's in the book. Um, and 
It parallels in so many ways the story of the rivalry between the two hemispheres. Part of the story, though, is that the more foolish brother can be redeemed by being taken under the tutelage of the wiser brother. What we need to do is to begin strengthening the mode of understanding the wisdom of the right hemisphere in all the ways that is currently under threat from a culture mesmerized by the power-hungry left hemisphere, flint with his arrow. We need to start looking more broad broadly, more deeply, taking charge of our destiny, becoming captains of our souls. When things lack depth, we say they lack soul. Whatever is deep and broad, the ocean and the mountains, for example, is sublime. And the sublime seems to me to speak not just of heart or mind, but of the soul. Looking deeper, seeing the broader picture, all helps nurture the soul. And yes, meditation, prayer, religious rituals, all reconnect us with what I would call the soul. And I hope I've persuaded you that we cannot dispense with this important word, this term. We can find the sublime also in the experience of love, I mean earthly love, which for many may now be the readiest way to become aware of having a soul. We may mistake the nature of what we seek. The spiritual is often to be found in places where we are not looking for it. And to make it more complex, it will not be at the focal point of our attention, since it is itself the ground of the kind of attention that reveals it. In this it's somewhat like the eye that grounds our sight, but is itself necessarily unseen. And so we need to cultivate openness to whatever is. In one of his letters and papers from prison, written while Dietrich Bonhoeffer was interned by the Nazis, before being starved, stripped naked, and hanged by the Nazis, he wrote, God requires that we should love him eternally with our whole hearts, yet not so as to compromise or diminish our earthly affection, but as a kind of cantus firmus to which the other melodies of the life provide the counterpoint. Now, in that piece that you heard, it's called the Western Wind Mass because there was um, a medieval song, O Western Wind, When Wilt Thou Blow? And the tune of that is used, as was often the case, in polyphony, in other words, the many voices of the music of that time. And it's called the cantus firmus, the bit that doesn't change, and the other voices make their harmonies by fitting around it, above it, and below it, and weaving it. So to go back to what he says, where the ground base is firm and clear, there's nothing to stop the counterpoint from being developed to the utmost of its limits. Only a polyphony of this kind can give life a wholeness and assure us that nothing can go wrong so long as the cantus firmus is kept going. Put your faith in the cantus firmus. What he's saying there is that if you, if you hold fast to the sort of royal truths of the sacred world, we can afford to enjoy and not turn our backs on and to become involved in the lives that we are incarnated here to live. And what, amazingly enough, he was affirming is that there's nothing about the soul that requires our alienation from our turning of our backs to the world, but quite the opposite. And the musical metaphor of the cantus firmus, the single melodic line around which all the other lines may move, enriching rather than diminishing it, is, for me, a very powerful expression of why the soul is not the enemy of the body, but its very life blood, if one might put it that way. Finally, what can we say about the soul and bodily death? As I've argued, the soul is both in and transcends the body, as a poem is in and yet transcends mere language, a melody in yet transcends mere sound, a painting in yet transcends the merely frescoed wall. I believe it's the business of the cosmos to bring into being ever greater individuation, to precipitate out uniqueness from the whole, without in any way jeopardizing the integrity of that whole, but rather enriching it, and enriching the complexity and the beauty of that whole. So I see the cosmos as a perpetual unfolding 
of something that is constantly revealing what is hidden there in it, like a bud that matures into the flower. And the flower is not the negation of the bud. The flower is the fulfillment of the bud, although the bud has now given way to the flower. And that flower doesn't diminish the wholeness. It, in fact, unveils, unconceals the truth of its wholeness. And if that's the case, our unfolding or unfurling or whatever it is, our rendering of the implicate, momentarily explicate, is a part of a, a world vision that is common to a physicist such as David Bohm and to um, a great church thinker and mystic, Nicholas of Cusa, in the 15th century. And this pattern that David Bohm described as a physicist, he wrote a book on the implicate order, and what he was talking about is that he believed the physical world is this unfolding of a richness within, which is then re-embraced and turned into a new whole, which can then unfold into something else. So there is this process of ongoing development in which one thing gives place to another more richly. And th this pattern was exactly prefigured by uh, somebody I don't think Bohm ever referred to, the 15th century polymath, theologian, scientist, mathematician, and cardinal Nicholas of Cusa. He tried to explain his understanding of the relationship between God and his creation through a metaphor of unfolding what was folded in or implicate from inside outwards and then enfolding from outside inwards. According to this formulation, while all beings are an unfolding of God in time and space, they are at the same time enfolded in the undifferentiated oneness of God, their divine source. I believe this, like Bohm's more famous account of physics, is consonant with the right-to-left-to-right -to -right progress of our phenomenological world coming into being through the bipartite brain. If it is... It's yet another instance of what I found runs throughout the matter with things, the coming together quite independently, as it would seem, of insights from physics with philosophy and neurology. One way to make that business of unfolding but then re-enfolding to something, a now more enriched whole can be made more understandable in homely terms by thinking about a piece of music if you play an instrument. You're attracted to this piece of music as a whole, obviously. So that is your right hemisphere having a take on this and you, you want to play it. And when you start to play it, you find that you need to break it down into parts. You need to practice certain bars over and over again until you get them right. And you need to understand something about the theoretical structure of the piece of music. Aha, here we return to the tonic or whatever it may be. But when you go out and play that piece to an audience, you must forget all of that. It's not that it was pointless doing it. It was very important. But now it must go back into being hidden. It comes out for a while, but then goes away again. And that performance is better than anything that you could have done without the practice but the practice is not where you stop now it seems to me that in our world we begin with the right hemisphere we go to the left hemisphere and then we leave it there we don't take it back into the wider broader understanding of the right hemisphere and this is also rather like the relationship, I, I, I resist all comparisons between the brain and the computer because it's not like the computer for many many reasons but in one limited sense, you can think of the left hemisphere as the sort of personal computer of the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere understands something, and in order to maintain its overall view, it doesn't want to get involved in crunching numbers. So it has a handy accountant, which is the left hemisphere, and it hands it all to the, to the accountant, who sticks all this stuff into a computer. The computer is spewed out the other end. The computer has no idea what it's just produced. But the person who is interested in the whole picture can take this data back and now incorporate it into a richer understanding of the whole. Now that is a very important image to bear in mind. That is how these hemispheres work best. When the right hemisphere both begins and ends the process, and the left hemisphere is an intermediate processor. But in our world, we take beautiful, complex things we don't understand, and then break them up into bits, and then say, well, 
now we've got an ultimate understanding because we've broken it down to its basic parts. It doesn't seem to mean anything at all. Well, science cannot prove, as people think it has, that life is purposeless or that these values I'm talking about are not real but something we made up. I don't believe any of this. But the point about science is that it rules out such values and such purpose from the word go. That's not a criticism of science. That's an important part of its method. It wants to do things without getting involved with ideas of purpose and value. It just wants to work out what happens when you do certain things. But to believe that that science has somehow told us anything at all about the big questions that we're discussing here today is to misunderstand what science does. And it's rather like to use an image by C.S. Lewis, a policeman stopping all the traffic in a street and then getting out his notebook and writing solemnly, the silence in this street is very suspicious. And I think that's, <laughs> that's what we do. We go, well, we've broken it all down. There's nothing there. You know, it's, I know. Do you remember Faulty Towers? Are you old enough to remember Faulty Towers? And I think it's, is it episode five of the first series when the chef gets drunk and um, the Cleese figure, Basil Faulty, has to go out to Andre's restaurant and pick up what he hopes is a duck for the gala dinner that they're having at the hotel. And unfortunately, while well, he's not looking, somebody comes in, picks up the duck, takes it out and replaces it with a blancmange. And so, Cleese takes this back to his hotel, there's a basil faulty, takes it back. And there's a wonderful thing that only John Cleese can do, he's such a great actor, is he, he sort of pulls this trolley and he starts going into the dining room with, you know, expression of, ha ha, we've got it here, you know, this is the duck you were waiting for takes the cover off the dish and there's just a blumage there and he goes <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes ducks off and, and I'm sure you all remember it but this is what we've done and we've done it really with the wonderful thing of um, sequencing the human genome you know a, 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 an enormous labour and a great one and I don't want to diminish it in any way but what we found there was virtually nothing there's virtually no instructions in DNA it was thought to be a blueprint for creating an organism but it has nowhere near enough information I mean not just by a factor of 10 but by a factor of thousands or millions it just doesn't contain enough information it's stored somewhere else and, you know, if you ask me where my bet for that is, I believe that fields of force are becoming more and more important in physics. We now discover the world is made of form fields that take various shapes and so on. And I, I think that, you know, my much maligned friend and colleague, um, Rupert Sheldrake, is going to be proved right about this, that there are what he called morphogenetic fields, which make matter take certain paths and routes and patterns. Anyway, my concluding words are from the American philosopher Eugene Gendlin, who said somewhere, we think more than we can say. We feel more than we can think. We live more than we can feel. And there's much else besides. Perhaps the soul is what we mean when we reflect on that so much else besides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.